<laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Joe Arnold, and I'm one of the co-founders of SwiftStack. And today, we're going to have Dirk Peterson from uh, the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Institute talk about how they're using HPC and Swift. Uh, Dirk, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, yeah, so I'm Dirk uh, Peterson, Scientific Computing Director at Fred Hutch. Done this job for a couple of years, and recently we got into Swift. Excellent. Do you want to do the intro slide here? That was yours. That's mine. That's yours. <laughs> the challenge. OK. <laughs> well, OK, so the challenge here is, uh, is the need to have an archive system to offload expensive storage. And what we're seeing right now, particularly in the high performance computing workloads, is that it's not sufficient anymore to have tape be that archive tier. It needs to be available because at some period in point in time, in order to run a, a, an HPC compute job, you need to have that data available and it needs to be able to feed into that, uh, into that, into that HPC cluster. However, it needs to be low cost. And that's kind of, that's the rub. And so uh, what, we're, what we're gonna talk through here is how to use Swift so that you can integrate it into the HPC environment. Uh, we're gonna talk about um, kind of the, the story that Fred Hutchinson took to decide going down this path, some of the costs of doing this, and then again, some of the, so, and then some of the tools on how to do that actual integration, and that's what we're gonna be talking about in today's talk. Super, so now it's me. Now it's you. Yeah. Go. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so uh, Fred Hutch um, is not a technology company. Um, it's a pretty conservative uh, cancer research center in the best sense of it. We um, are about you know, half a billion dollar budget. Uh, most of it is government funded, about 3,000 employees. And uh, we can be seen as kind of a, some people call it as a research mall that central IT provides services to a lot of decentralized research groups. Uh, who all have all their individual needs. And, uh, uh, and let's go into the next one. So we have uh, multiple data centers. It has kind of been organically grown. It also depends a lot on, on government funding. Um, these data centers are geographically, I wouldn't call it geographically distributed, but they are on campus in multiple locations. And we wanted to take advantage of that fact. We have about 100 staff, a couple of sysadmins, and um, uh, we started uh, to uh, venture into something like storage chargebacks. And at the same time, we uh, also had, and you see this here, uh, we have a lot of capacity. You see all these empty racks. They yeah, are, I was going to say, those they're, they're, still, they're, still empty. Empty. they're still empty. <laughs> <laughs> and we have uh, probably one of the, if you are into data centers, uh, 1.03 PUE is, uh, I've never seen something lower. It's natural air cooled. And we are in Seattle where it's always like very mild. So. Uh, this is kind of the, 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 the setting uh, when, when we said, oh, we need to find some technology that actually works well with all of that. Uh, that's right. you again. So that's me again. So yeah. about SwiftStack. So what, what we do at, at, at SwiftStack is we work on, on OpenStack Swift and, and develop that, that, that open source engine. There's a big community, lots of developers that are part of that. And uh, we're, we're, we're one, of the, one of the leading contributors uh, it, to that project. And what we do as a company is we build a uh, we build the de deployment, the management, and the operations tools so that it's it's easy to deploy, it's easy to scale the, an OpenStack Swift environment. Then um, we've add, added capabilities around that, so things like um, how to do user authentication, how to do chargeback, which is uh, one of the things that we're going to talk about here, and and we'll get into some of the more of the details of uh, of that later into the talk. Uh, we also have a couple of resources that folks might want to check out. So at our booth, we have um, a, a book about object storage being used for genomics. And we take some, a lot of the lessons learned uh, with Dirk Peterson and Fred Hutch Cancer Research Institute. Um, also uh, with, uh, with Brandon at Hudson Alpha, which we'll hear about in a minute. And we talk about this use case and, and, and how important it is to have these really large scale storage environments uh, for HPC and, and sequencing projects. And then we also have a, an O'Reilly book, which is 
just all about Swift. And if you want to roll up your sleeves and, and learn about all the nuts and bolts on how OpenStack Swift works, um, that's, the, that's the book to check out. So a couple of resources there. Um, they're also available on our website at uh, swiftstack.com slash books. And here's the thing that we found, was that the researchers and these research institutions had very, very high storage costs. And you would see, if you were to map back the price per terabyte storage costs for uh, a NAS environment, it would be uh, $40, uh, $40 per terabyte per month, which was really high. And they were really asking for something that was much, much lower cost basis, because they would turn around and they look at the public cloud and think, oh my gosh, like that, that's what I'm baselining my cost against. And so as a result, what they would do is go out to Best Buy or wherever the local retail and just start buying stacks of, of hard drives. And this is actually a picture of a bunch of, of, of personal NAS units sitting in some researcher's desktop area. And all this data, it's not secured. You're not going to be able to collaborate with it. You're not going to be able to feed this into any future research projects. So it, it, it's, it's definitely an organizational mess. So if you go towards um, uh, the, the, the NAS environment, it's high cost. If people take this approach, then it's, it's a, bit of a, a bit of a chaos. So this is part of the things that, uh, that we're seeing need to be solved, particularly in these high performance computing environments. So co cost, we talk about cost, 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 cost a lot. And uh, it, cost is not necessarily only an, 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 an absolute number. Um, we see that the finance folks, uh, if there's something that costs that much and that much, it may very well be that that is better. Um, it's also about predictability. Um, if you have to do a forklift upgrade of your uh, tape environment every couple of years, then uh, you, you aim to predict the, the cost for that, but it's not always possible. And so it becomes sometimes a little bit of a surprise. Something is end of life, and you, uh, it's, it's prematurely end of life. And then you come up with this big check uh, that uh, they have to cut then. Uh, and it comes as a surprise. So they don't like surprises. And they like uh, uh, the, the cost to, to, if they grow, they like to grow them steadily and not having these step functions. Um, cost again. I've, I've done a similar talk last year. Uh, where we compared uh, the, the, the NAS uh, system here, that's uh, basically a standard scale-out NAS system with uh, Amazon and Google. And of course, they see, yeah, our current storage is more expensive than what we can get in the cloud. What's the consequence of that? And here we have our current SwiftStack environment uh, is at $11. We, SwiftStack uh, got a little cheaper. The cloud surprisingly stayed all put. And even on the NAS front, we haven't seen that much decline. So uh, we see actually that the costs are not decreasing anymore. Uh, you know, we can see 15% uh, or 10%, uh, you know, sometimes 8% per year. Uh, and we don't know where that's getting us. Uh, currently, we are down to glacier costs almost. Um, there's another component that's interesting. And you might have seen that Swift is uh, you can actually put multiple uh, zones and multiple regions. And uh, each zone uh, costs about $1 per terabyte per month for us. That is a, a tenth of Glacier. So that means if we want to have a, a geographically distributed uh, location somewhere, we can actually buy the hardware and get that for $2 a terabyte a month. That's, that's, really, a, that's really a good number. I mentioned before, chargebacks uh, for us drove a lot of these behaviors. So we, uh, put a sophisticated chargeback uh, mechanism in place. Uh, it's all SharePoint based right now uh, because the administrative folks are used typically Windows computers with SharePoint, uh, and it's been um, uh, it's been adopted uh, quite well. We had a go live in mid 2014, um, and uh, there was a, there was really strong interest. I mean, it was kind of surprising for us that the interest was uh, so strong. Uh, researchers just don't want to uh, pay the price. They always get back to you. Uh, at this, with this Best Buy drive example, and uh, the result was kind of this. So here we, we started uh, the charging, uh, officially was November 1st, and we had announced it in uh, 2013. Um, so long, That's a long, long warning, right? But then in mid-October, people realized, oh, chargebacks are coming, 
And so they uh, started to actually move stuff over at rapid speed. Uh, then suddenly we uh, hit the wall. This is the yellow line where we say, okay, at, that's the time when we need to expand. And so we stopped the whole process for a bunch of time and then we bought new hardware um, and had a couple of other things. And then uh, we started then later and it, uh, the, the growth started again here. So that's a, uh, that's a really fascinating story. A little bit <laughs> interesting here is uh, what are these blips? We had a, um, a maintenance of one data center. This is all across three data centers. And uh, the one uh, data center had to have a new power supply or a new uh, powertrain late. And it had to be uh, on two weekends, on two following weekends, consecutive weekends. And uh, what did we do to actually sustain the maintenance? We just shut down the servers in that data center. It was basically just uh, running the shutdown command on Linux, uh, uh, parking them for an entire day. Uh, and then bring them up again, and it all synchronized. And so there was no uh, single second uh, uh, outage, or there was even not a ping lost uh, for, for a Swift cluster. That was quite fascinating. Another thing you see here is um, there's a blip down. We do have a, a piece of software in there that um, is, uh, we call it the undelete, or it's a trash can. And if people delete data, then it will be held in this trash can for about, uh, about 60 days. And uh, then you see then finally that, that you know, sometimes storage is reduced. Uh, that, that's the way uh, how we do our backup. We, we don't have any tape backup behind it. And the trash can is uh, fulfilling this need. Yeah, can I just add to that? So that was, yeah. that's something that we, we, when we were starting to work with right. you, that realized that sometimes researchers would delete a bunch of data. That was a concern that right. you had. And right. instead of having a, a, a separate backup, take that data, move it to another storage system, and then archive it, what this does is it basically treats it like a f trash can on uh, your desktop, but for giant HPC sets of data. So if someone does delete something, Right. Then it's a configurable number of, of, of days that you can retain that yeah. and return it. That was a very critical component for us in, in Swift to have the undelete feature. It is a unique thing that you can only get in Swift because only Swift supports uh, these middleware tools that you can put into to intercept calls. And uh, it was like, it's not actually a, a giant piece of software, it's actually pretty simple. And that helps us to really uh, get the storage cost down to a minimum. Uh, tape for us is surprisingly expensive because we are low scale. Tape is almost as expensive as Swift. And if we want to have a backup of your Swift cluster, then you're yet again <laughs> at something, uh, you know, then you're almost at Amazon pricing again. So we really wanted to avoid that. And that was a critical component for the success. Today, we can migrate about 30 terabyte per day. That's pretty good. Uh, we do not actually need that. Uh, we are OK with 5 terabyte, but we get 30. So taking it. Um, this is um, a, a boring slide. <laughs> it's uh, the, the, the standard uh, system we use, the standard storage hardware, is a well-known Supermicro 36 drive hardware. Um, it is deployed in in thousands of data centers uh, around the world. It's basically just a, a standard workhorse. Uh, two things to note here is that we, um, unlike some of the other uh, talks you saw before, we, we went, again, lowest cost. Uh, we are deploying desktop-grade drives, uh, the ones that people tell you not to use. Uh, and they work actually quite fine with, with Swift. Um, and uh, we also have uh, some SSDs here. You saw that in the Ceph talk perhaps earlier that people kind of standardize on these kind of Intel S3700. And the SSDs are to uh, cache metadata. So even if you have maybe slow uh, uh, object transfers, or if you think that you have them, you will get uh, directory browsing and metadata operations are really fast using these uh, extremely low cost SSDs here. You might mind if I just yeah. touch on this? So we, we've, we've put a couple of these hardware configurations on the slide so that uh, everyone can see some of the different configurations that people use for different use cases. Like when we saw the Ancestry.com one um, a, a, a last session, it was much more high performance equipment. Well, and there was more tiers. There was a proxy tier, account container tier, an object tier. Well, this configuration, everything runs on, this, on these nodes. And they yeah. scaled just by adding another one of these units into, 
you know, an existing rack or a rack next door to it. So that was a question, right? So you want to optimize performance or capacity, and we said, you know, can you just add a bit of RAM and add a proxy to it? And they said, sure, you can. So you know, let's do it. And it's it's a very very simplified architecture through that. It almost looks like scale out NAS, basically. It's it's from a from, from a, a from a from a from an architecture diagram, uh -huh. a bunch of boxes, uh, uh, you know, wired together with cable. Uh, you don't need any InfiniBand. It's just all uh, Ethernet. So it's, it's it's the most simple thing you can possibly imagine here. Um, SwiftStack. SwiftStack, an out of band management controller, and that's uh, the the key to to that. Um, if I have my SwiftStack controller and it does something, then uh, it, it, it doesn't necessarily affect the Swift cluster. I can have my Swift cluster, it's completely contained, uh, and occasionally, maybe once a week, maybe once a month, maybe twice a week, I need to manage that. And this controller lives in the cloud, and I can, can log into that controller, and it then does uh, uh, manage our, our hardware that's on-prem through uh, secure channels. Um, so SwiftStack provides the control, visibility, monitoring. Uh, we have authentication, LDAP, Active Directory integration. Uh, we talked about the undelete feature that has been developed by uh, SwiftStack. Is it open source? It's, is it? Well, uh, it's on some GitHub repository. I'm sure it's somewhere, <laughs> but it's a checkbox. Yeah, the, it's a checkbox. The um, yeah. And then capacity, alerting. So it's, it's all within this GUI um, that is incredibly easy to use for us. Do you want to? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think having you walk through this is probably more valuable than I mean. The, one, one thing about uh, Dirk, Dirk mentioned there is uh, we offer the the controller in two models. Like one is uh, the way they're using it, which is a uh, hosted version of the controller, which is something that we operate in some of our data centers, and there's a, a connection that comes into that controller at, to to manage on-premise hardware. Well, uh, the other option is the that management controller can also co-reside next to the, the, the equipment as well, and we have customers using, using both configurations. Um, and, and it depends on, it's an, it's an interesting discussion, it depends really on what your security team is comfortable with at the end of the day, right? You could say, okay, I have it in my data center, it's more secure. But is that really true? Uh, because SwiftStack manages this thing 24-7, and, uh, and our sysadmins don't manage the thing in our data center, right? So you can, it's, it's kind of a discussion that you need to have with your security team, uh, whatever they are more comfortable with. It's also a combination of different use cases right. and different stages that people are, are evaluating uh, the system, right? Usually yeah. when people get started and want to try and uh, try and evaluate it, they're almost always using the, the, the hosted controller and uh, then you know, use cases where they don't want to have to manage that uh, extra management plane, that's when they would, they would use the, the hosted version in, yeah. in, a, in a production context. Yeah. This is the, the key feature uh, that I like most with uh, SwiftStack. It's uh, the, the, first of all, it's deployment automation. So you can, you can install, uh, you can bring up your, you have, a, you have your hardware installed, you run, uh, you bring up your, your shell, uh, you type a bunch of commands, they connect to this controller, they pull down the software, they install the software, then uh, you join them to this controller and that takes, you know, 10 minutes perhaps and you're done, and then you wonder, oh, this is all my project. I had you know, reserved so much time for my storage project, and I had allocated all these resources, and I'm already done. So you're kind of you know, excited and disappointed. It's all done. Um, and, but that, the deployment, and that's a really important thing in OpenStack and whatever you see on this card, but deployment, uh, you see a hundred of uh, deployment options and tools out there, uh, but you don't really see a lot of upgrade, in-place upgrade, in-production upgrade. Uh, and you don't really see this. You don't see a button that's orange that you can click, and, uh, and you see sysadmins are hovering around this button, and they wonder, well, this is this. You know, it's just like that, a button upgrade, and should I click it or not? And then you click it, and then things happen, and 20 minutes later, your entire platform is upgraded to the latest version. Uh, you can run this completely in production at uh, 2 o'clock in the afternoon, um, and it's, uh, it's, it's fully transparent. So that's, that's one of the, and I hear that there's a lot of work behind this button. So the, yeah, so, yeah the, the, <laughs> there's a lot of work. The, bu the button, how it works is, is so uh, it's a distributed systems archite architecture, and, and uh, a single node can be pulled out of the cluster and requests can be routed around. So we kind of take advantage of that. Um, we control the uh, load balancing tier 
above as well, so we can, we can be careful in terms of routing traffic. And so what we do is we'll, we'll pick a node that we want to do the upgrade process on, and we'll tell the load balancer, hey, begin pulling this thing out of the load balancing group. Meanwhile, we're gonna complete the existing TCP streams that are on that particular node and wait till they drain out. And once they're, once they're all drained out, then we'll, um, uh, we'll do that up upgrade cycle, do a test on it, and then reintroduce, reintroduce it back into the load balancing group. Um, and once we do that, then we can move on to the, on to the next one. And if it's an object storage node, really similar story. Um, it gets pulled out, and whatever's running the proxy server processes will understand that, hey, I'm going to set a back off interval, so I'm not going to keep sending requests out to that, to that storage node. And so then, from a user perspective, you, the, no user is going to see a, a connection drop while that upgrade process is happening. And again, if anything happens during that whole process, then an alert goes out and it, and it stops the process. Um, but what we do is we make sure that during the upgrade process, if the new version and the old version is Swift and you're left in a half upgraded state, that from an API perspective, it's compatible. And when we're introducing new capabilities, we make sure that you're not allowed to configure some of that new capability until you've already rolled out um, that, so you're not left in a, in a, in a halfway state. Mm -hmm. But the, the point is to make sure that uh, clients don't see any issues. And you can do an upgrade in the middle of the day rather than uh, doing it at 3 o'clock at night when <laughs> no one's really uh, coherent to do, to do a, a storage upgrade. Um, it's, it's better doing it in the middle of the day when you're fresh and you can address issues. And that's kind of the idea behind that. We see we have declared, and it's always uh, difficult to make that certain what kind of staffing resources you use. We are estimating 0.25, a quarter of an FTE per year, uh, and we're doing pretty okay on that right now. Um, I have seen, I've done a lot of research on Swift, pure Swift deployments before, and I've seen one, 1 1.5 something FTEs uh, to manage a Swift cluster, a larger Swift cluster. So um, if you are uh, trying to roll Swift yourself, uh, do this also, uh, try it out, and you know, make up your mind what you want to do. It's, it's, uh, it's pretty straightforward. Um, talking about uh, HPC use cases and tools, so typically Swift has always this uh, a, a reputation of an archive. We're talking about archive workflows. Um, we, we, we only recently talk about higher performance stuff, and this is also one of the things where we, uh, where we, where we like the benefit. You know, we had, our requirement was really low in terms of performance, so the researchers said we don't want to pay any money. Uh, but once the system is in place, uh, they say, well, uh, it, it, it shouldn't be slow, right? So when you bring up a, a system that can't scale, uh, like a tape system, then you have the complaints and you have to live with the investment for five to seven years. Um, as you see, uh, when we run our HPC system, we're getting an aggregate throughput of about three gigabytes per second. That's uh, basically a 10G backbone completely saturated. Uh, so it's, uh, the network is really the bottleneck. We can, uh, we've currently like 15, 15 Swift nodes, and they, are, uh, they, can, they can really max out the, uh, the networking infrastructure. And this is pretty good for an HPC uh, kind of workflow. So um, now we get to this point. Uh, we are a traditional, I mentioned that, we're a traditional company. And uh, most users, they are used to their POSIX file system. Uh, we have multiple POSIX file systems mounted onto uh, our HPC system, and it's just easy. You open up a file, and you edit it, and you save it, or you copy it. And um, now we're going into object storage, right? It's not a file system. Uh, we have containers. Before, we, some people talk about like folders or containers. It really doesn't matter. But you know, in object, you use these terminologies. And uh, the first thing is that people see is, well, uh, uh, where's my subdirectory? I, I, you know, it's not there, and so then it's it's a confusion, and then what people start to jump into is they you know, want to venture in putting some sort of gateway in front of it, uh, some appliance in front of it, uh, to make it work like a traditional file system. But uh, we want to explore some ways of uh, to not do that, to just use pure Swift, and maybe maybe it actually does meet our requirements. So let's talk about that. Um, in Swift, we can basically simulate all the subdirectories by putting a forward slash into the object name. And many tools, or most tools, actually recognize that and are able to display this as folders if you, if you use these tools. So you basically uh, put, a, put, a, put, a, put a, a slash in, and you can see this here. 
you do um, have a pseudo folder and then you have a container and this pseudo folder has a slash in it and it's going to be interpreted as a, um, as a, as a, as a directory, a subdirectory. Um, of course, um, <laughs> when you see this, is everybody excited about this? <laughs> this is what you, uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, go to your end user and say, uh, Jerry, this is what you need to do. It's really easy. You just need to type segment size, that, container name, blah, 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 and then you have it uploaded. And then Jerry turns around to you and looks at you as if you have been abducted by aliens. And uh, he said, no, I'm not going to want to use it. So, um, but it's not really a big problem. You can basically just wrap it. We do this all the time as HPC people. There's complex bioinformatics tools that have 15 different command line options. And we're writing wrappers so that to simplify our workflows for the end user. And this is, this, this is this, the same thing. So we wrote this tool called Swift Commander. And instead of uh, all the mumble jumble that Jerry uh, has to do before, you just have to type SWC upload, you know, my local folder, my, my Swift folder, and you're done. And then we added another goodie to it that was like SWC compare that basically takes the, the size of the source and the size of the destination. You know, it's not an MD5 sub check, but it gives you a good indication whether it actually was successful because some of these uploads, they take hours and hours and you may not, you may not have seen the result of it, right? And so the, the sub commands, uh, we stole them actually from Google. Google has this uh, tool, GSUtil, that uh, implements GSUtil, all these like, traditional Unix subcommands. And when you show that to an end user, they see, ah, oh, I, I know how to do this. And you, know, you just add this other little thing in front of it, and you're, you're back in business. So we use the Python Swift client. The Python Swift client is multi-threaded. Uh, it has enormous performance. Um, it is very stable now. And we also use curl for some other uh, latency sensitive things in that uh, on the back end. So there's no real risk in using this tool uh, for us. It's you know, some self homegrown thing, but underlying is, is really all the power of like the Swift client under it. We have, um, people talk a lot about metadata. Eventually we may have uh, tools that allow us to research uh, you know, very complex metadata, but we don't have them today. So we just want to see how can we get going on this. Um, but it's actually quite easy. The Swift client also supports metadata. Um, it's, again, not completely user-friendly, but uh, how about you just add some key value pairs here, simple as command line option three, four, and five, and then they are stored as metadata in the Swift cluster. And then you can retrieve them later. And once you have more mature tools, you can actually use those as well. It's very simple. Uh, people see that, I said, oh yeah, that's really simple and it's useful for me uh, because I can't find my stuff uh, easily anymore. So this is uh, a, a way to, to handle that one. Um, in, in high performance computing, um, again, we don't have a file system, right? You don't have, you can't just open the file and that confuses people at first. But then in, in HPC, uh, people writing like 50 lines of super complex batch submission scripts that uh, have all sorts of things in them. And I said, so, so you're writing this very complex script to do something, but then you can't just add another thing into it in order to get your file. Uh, and then you just show them, well, you can just you know, see if the file exists in your scratch file system, and if it doesn't, you just download it with, a, with, Swift, with a Swift Commander, and you know, you're back in business. So you're adding three lines to a really complex uh, batch submission script, and, and you're, you're in there. So they're using that today, and it's, uh, uh, it's actually you know, it's not really an issue with it. <laughs> Um, talking about performance in, uh, with Swift, so um, here's one use case. So let's say we want to like regenerate BAM files are these files, the genomic archives that contain uh, uh, basically your entire genome. Uh, they're up to 150 gigabytes large. And uh, you don't need them very often, but if you need them, you don't really want to wait four days until they are restored from your tape because research is often ad hoc. Um, and, and also decisions are made over the weekend. And so you have the ability here to, to really copy lots of files in, in, with very high performance. In this case, um, you can see that we have, uh, um, we have this uh, parallelized uh, batch submission that we use to download things on the cluster. And uh, you can uh, so you submit uh, like 30 jobs on this cluster and then we're getting 1.4 gigabytes per second throughput. 
Um, again, that, that's limited by my own allocation. Uh, I, I, I manage this cluster, but I didn't give myself unlimited resources, so um, uh, that you know you can't drown the resource. And you see here, here's our scratch file system. It's, it's, an, it's a BGFS uh, high performance file system, where you can actually see that uh, the throughput is, uh, is 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 real. How are we on time? We have. We have plenty of time. Good. And that's we'll always pressure. Probably end a little bit early. So good. good. That, that's great. Um, and you tell me when you're bored, then you can accelerate <laughs> this a little bit. Um, then, frequent use case. You can buy the most expensive scale-out NAS system. You can spend millions of dollars. But if it comes to uh, copying a bunch of small files from A to B, they are all not good. There's no good solution to that. Uh, use tools like rsync, CP, anything. Uh, it, is, it, is, it is everything that is mounted via NFS is, 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 is not going to be very fast. Um, part, part of the reason is most tools are not parallelized, so rsync is not really uh, a parallel tool. Um, and one, one solution to that that we found productive is actually uh, saying, um, let's tar it up. But again, then the problem is if you tar something up and it is like four, four terabyte or 10 terabyte under that directory structure, then this big hunking tar ball becomes very, very inefficient to use. <laughs> Uh, so we basically did this on a directory level, basically one tarball per directory level, and you can then uh, uh, archive it very easily and also restore it very easily. So in this case, um, you can just uh, uh, restore um, this uh, uh, folder two and folder three, and you don't have to restore folder one, and you, you save some time on that. And it's, uh, th those, those files are then typically a couple of hundred gigs, which is easy to handle. Um, we were able to get a before at 400 megabytes, so the compression algorithm that we use is a, 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 P, a PIG-Z multi-threaded uh, algorithm. On, uh, it's gzip compatible, so you basically can uh, get the files always back with standard gzip, so you don't have to use any other tools. Um, and you can uh, then get about, you know, what is it, like uh, 111 seconds using gzip and five seconds using uh, PIG-Z to upload this data. It's, it's, it has enormous performance. We've shared this on GitHub. Uh, feel free to use. Um, it, it, it works quite well. Now, we're talking command line, command line, command line, but not everybody uh, works with a command line. Um, in, in our special case, we often have uh, huge directory structures with lots of big data, also a lot of small files that are machine generated. And then you find occasionally in that folder the Excel spreadsheet where somebody uh, kept track of some other metadata that wasn't machine generated. And they keep their log in the Excel spreadsheet and they want it in that folder. Uh, they don't want it on another drive or on their desktop. They want it with that project. So they put it in there. Um, and sometimes they need to access that Excel spreadsheet. And for that, we really need uh, Windows and Mac-based clients that uh, have GUIs uh, where you just click on and you know, it opens up and you edit your stuff and you save it back. It's, it's, it's probably about 0.1% of the data that is used that way, but if you can't have it easily, then uh, people are not going to adopt the system. So we have, uh, uh, this is Cyberduck. Uh, Cyberduck is very functional, it has lots of features. You can actually edit the metadata with Cyberduck that you uh, uh, uploaded with Swift Commander. You can change it with Cyberduck. It's, a, it's, a, it's an extremely uh, versatile uh, tool, but it is, not yet your Windows Drive that uh, some of the people in your group might want, or the Mac uh, Finder integration. So it's not, it's not that yet. And so that's, that's what we have here. Um, I've been personally working actively with uh, Storage Made Easy and also with Expand Drive. They have, uh, uh, they have tools that actually can mount Swift at the Windows Drive. So you can basically let people not know that you're using Swift. You can just say, here's your Drive O, and you can store your data. What credentials uh, do you get? Do they use to, to log it to do that to do that mapping? Um, they can they can they can do both. So so we have uh, a, a shared account, a Swift account, and that uh, account is either used directly if they don't have any special requirements, or you use Active Directory. Um, you use you and there's a there's a, a, a hash. It's not yet integrated in, with Kerberos in Windows, but that's one of the things on the roadmap. Uh, you still have to actually enter your password. It's uh, encrypted in, in the registry. Uh, it's your AD password. Um, so these work 
These work pretty well. They are not high performance, but again, the use case is you want to browse your directory structure. Directories are typically frowned upon with object storage people, but they are very important metadata because you have it in directories. It's what's there. Right? So you need to like browse through there and, uh, and get to your data, and it's really fast. So we, again, we have Swift uh, uh, metadata on SSD, so the browsing through these folders is actually like a window share. It's not a, not a big difference. Where it falls a little short is if you copy massive amounts of data from your one drive to this other one, these don't work very well because they also have local caching and they're more built like for cloud environments where the, where the, where the object store is very far away. Um, and uh, we are very, very local, so the performance is, 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 is limited. But it's functional and, and works well. And it's also an, 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 an entry to uh, some grander thing. So if you take, uh, for example, the Storage Made Easy tool, uh, Storage Made Easy offers like a, a full cloud uh, sharing, file sharing solution. Um, but that's a project. You need to, if you want to deploy something like that, it's, it involves servers, it involves security. Um, it, it, is, uh, it is an extra step. It, it offers a lot more functionality uh, than this drive. But this drive is basically you can walk up to your desktop support team uh, in, in since, I don't know, four or five years, I think, even in most enterprises, automated software deployment uh, is, has taken over. There's very few uh, sneaker sysadmins left now who manually install all of these things. So you can basically deploy these really well, and you can, you can solve this on a local level. And then when you uh, have grander plans later, you can actually take it to the step and you can replace it with something like the Storage Made Easy uh, uh, application, the, 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 the larger framework, and, uh, and, and it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good migration path. A couple minutes. How many minutes? Two. Two more minutes? Okay. All right, so here um, is another example, our clone, multi-threaded mass copy backup and data migration. We did this with, uh, on Windows. It's an application written in Go, very fancy. Uh, it works very well. You can put it on your Mac. Um, you can put it on, on Windows, and we use this to uh, uh, back stuff up uh, from Windows desktops, or from Windows Server, sorry. And then uh, this, is a, this is more like for life science people. Galaxy is the most used uh, web um, application for data intensive biology. And we drove uh, together with uh, SwiftStack and together with the Galaxy folks and our local uh, research team at Fred Hutch, uh, the Metzen Group, we uh, drove an integration to make that work. So Galaxy uh, can use huge amounts of data and it can use Swift today. And, that, and that's it. So, I mean, the, 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 the big takeaway is that um, discovery that people are doing in the bioinformatics and the research space, it's not necessarily a, pro a problem of generating the data, the primary data that's used for research. So I think some, some of the big issues are how storage and HPC environments can interact with that data, and that's ultimately what's unlocking some of the dis discoveries. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, that's, that's kind of the, the takeaway. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, thanks, uh, Dirk, for, for sharing. And uh, we do have a, a few copies of the book, which are oops, oops, falling down there. But if you want to get a copy and, and hear more about uh, some of these tools and some of the stories uh, ar around HPC, then uh, please feel free to come up and grab one. And thanks, uh, Dirk, for, <laughs> for sharing the story with us. Questions? Yeah, questions does anyone have? Oh, the, so the question was, why do you need something like our clone right. if the system is already keeping replicas uh, in the system? Uh, it's basically we're using SwiftStack as a backup target. This is like a Windows server that does something uh, obscure that I don't want to explain. And this Windows server is, not, is, not, is, is running something local. And we use, uh, we use uh, SwiftStack uh, as a backup target for that. And we're using our clone, and there's a ton of other tools. Our clone is just one example. That's a command line tool that I think that people people will like here, uh, and it's it's really functional. It's written in Go. It's really fast. 
it's not yet been very long in the field. So if you take like this, the Python Swift client, you know, some people like the Python Swift client, others don't. But I can say the Python Swift client is the thing that is very well developed. It's, there's a lot of developers on it. Uh, the, the, the responsiveness is very high, and it, it's, a, it's a really robust workhorse. Um, this may be a little bit more elegant. Written in Go, you know, there's some, it's, 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 it's a little, but it's not there yet in, in terms of like uh, uh, Mindshare. Uh, again, there's one developer developing it who's really good, um, but it's not, it's not tested in the field as well yet. Yeah, another question. That's a bit of a complicated question. <laughs> this is a domain specific use of Swift. I come from another domain, but the question applies. If you are storing data, uh, you have standard HTTP semantics for partial retrieval. Yeah, so the question, just so people can hear, uh, is there a semantics for partial retrieval of a large object? Is that correct? Right. I mean, if you have a multi-terabyte object and you want to do partial retrieval because only some part of the data is interesting, I mean, standard HTTP, you just do a, you know, offset and a length, but you mentioned middleware somewhere in the, mm -hmm. middleware yeah. in the middle of the doc. Is it possible to have domain-aware partial retrieval? So there's, there is a, a, what we call a range request in Swift. So you can ask for a byte offset for that. And there's, a, there's a, f a few strategies on how uploads happen. And I think what you've done is done a wrapper to take a very large file and break it up into multiple pieces. And then those are pushed into the cluster as in multiple streams. And that, that's what enables the, a lot of the throughput. Um, and but you can still do a, a byte offset of that, of that large file. I guess the question is, or to put it in more you know, specific terms, yeah. if I'm storing a very large video file, mm -hmm. and it could be any format, it could be a proprietary format, and I have some middleware that basically translates offsets in terms of time code into actual frames or bytes of data, is that something that can be built into Swift by us? Oh, that's a, oh, I got you. So the question yeah. is, can you, can you yeah. do something smarter in the middleware? So for example, in, with, right. uh, with like some of the, the BAMs or the FASTQ files that exist in the, in the genome sequencing space, um, there's going to be certain offsets that map to something logical. And so could you have a bit of middleware that's smart about that? Say, um, Brandon's going to correct me here, or you might correct, chromosome, you know, 18 and then yeah. pull that section out of, yeah. the, of, of, that, of that BAM or FASTQ. Yeah, that's middleware that you could develop inside of Swift. And likewise, so if you have a video transcoding then, to, to, to create that analogy, you have a large file and there's gonna be a time offset. Yeah, is that something that you can put into Swift to, to, yeah, to do yeah, offset on them? Sure. Write that logic in every application exactly, yeah, that's right. exactly. Yes, that's a great, that's a great idea. Yeah. Um, all right, we're out of time. Uh, Dirk, thank you for okay. the presentation. <laughs>